Amid the instability in the Middle East lies Egypt. But four years after the hope promised by the Arab Spring, arrests of protesters and dissidents in the country remain rampant and media freedom severely restricted. Joining us now for more on the situation there in Beirut, Lebanon via Skype, here's Rami Khoury, senior fellow in the Isam Faris Institute at the American University of Beirut. And we welcome back Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst. Rami, it's always good to have you on TVO. How are you doing tonight? Thank you. I'm fine. Glad to be with you. Glad to have you with us. Here I'm going to read something from the Financial Times by Gideon Ruckman to set up our discussion. This is uh, from a column he wrote, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago, six weeks ago. There was something symbolic about the warmth of the reception afforded to Field Marshal Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. It felt like the moment when the West abandoned its on-off flirtation with the democratization of the Middle East and retreated to the old formula, the embrace of an Arab strongman who offers short-term stability and the repression of militant Islamism. All right, that's one view of what transpired. Rami, do you share that view? Well, I don't think the West embraced anything uh, new or old. I think the West remains largely confused about what to do uh, about the several difficult trends going on in the Arab world. You still have populations uh, demonstrating and in case some places fighting and dying to get their freedom and, and democratic pluralism to get rid of the tyrants you have some uh, real wars going on in places like Syria you have Isis uh, in Iraq and, and other places you have countries like Libya and Iran fragmenting so there's like four or five major uh, uh, trends or dynamics taking place in different countries they're all somehow related but each one also is separate and i think the west is totally confused about what to do about these uh, issues so they do go for short term uh, what they call stability but uh, there is re there is no stability in embracing the egyptian army running egypt because it's precisely the fact that the egyptian army ran egypt from 1952 uh, to 2010 that created the popular uprisings that that shook most of the Arab world. So the military and government is the problem. It's not the solution. Hmm. Janice, do you see this re-embracing of the Arab strongman, so to speak? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think uh, Rami's right. It comes not so much out of confusion, Rami, but just out of fatigue, because the West really has no good options, and everything they seem to do fails. Uh, I mean, whether it's financial investment or supportive civil society or democracy talk, which is cheap often. Uh, so it's that. Um, and so in, in an, a region that is literally on fire in many parts of the world, you turn to the one leader who seems to be reliable. And he does seem to be reliable well, right now. But he's reliable for, for exactly, that's right. Mm -hmm. He's reliable in terms of the repression that he returns to Egypt. Uh, he's he can keep his word because there is no room for dissent uh, within Egypt. Now, in fact, the record of the al-Sisi regime is worse than the late Mubarak regime. And what we're doing here is watching a government that may be in place for another five years, 10 years, we can't put a limit on it, but we're guaranteed to have the same kind of explosion in Egypt uh, if the trends of the al-Sisi regime continue that we had against Mubarak. Guaranteed to have the same kind of Arab Spring Absolutely. Like against al-Sisi yes. that we saw against Hosni yes. Mubarak. Yes, it's just a question of when. It may be five years, it may be 10 years, it may be a year, but it's guaranteed. Rami, you agree? Absolutely. Um, it is guaranteed. And uh, the, the, all of the drivers of the original Arab uprisings uh, four years ago, uh, economic stress, uh, social alienation, political marginalization, corruption, uh, hard uh, police brutality, all of these are worse now than they were four and ten years ago. Uh, you have somewhere, to, yesterday an Egyptian reputable human rights group put out a report saying there may be up to 60,000 uh, Egyptians in jail, and they're not all Muslim brothers, they're also lefties, young revolutionaries, human rights activists. Uh, the, the, the government uh, yesterday shut down, I think, 17,000 uh, neighborhood mosques uh, all over Egypt. So what you're getting is a kind of an, uh, a neo-authoritarianism in Egypt, which is far more brutal than anything that came uh, before it. And this is absolutely going to uh, intensify those pressures 
that created the Arab uprisings. And remember that every year in Egypt, 1.5 million babies are born. We've had 6 million new Egyptians in the last four years. They all have to be fed, housed, schooled, given medical care, and, and later on given jobs and water and uh, reasonably priced food. There's no way that the Egyptian government with its current policies can keep up with this kind of demand uh, from its own uh, population. And the security situation is getting worse in the Sinai and, and on the Libyan border. So there are real, real serious uh, stresses in society that are getting more serious under CC and not less serious. Janice, does it look to you as if most Western countries care more about al-Sisi just clamping down on order and are less interested in democracy and civil rights. So, you know, we get an oscillation always, uh, in, in, particularly in, in U.S. policy, but in Western policy more, gen more generally. There is a, a burst of support for democratization, however you define that. Uh, and then when you get results that you don't like, whether it's the wrong parties, the, uh, quote, wrong parties winning the elections, or civil disturbance, or the overthrow of governments, then Western powers pull back and place their, their, all their bets on restoring stability and order. I think we're in one of those moments now where the desire for so-called stability and order is so great that they see LCC as an oasis uh, in the middle of a desert storm, really. The, you know, one of the things to watch for, and, and Rami talked about this, is youth unemployment in Egypt. If al-Sisi is not, regardless of the rhetoric and regardless of the police and the arrests, if in fact al-Sisi is not able to create jobs for young people over the next three or four years, remember what provoked the Arab uprising. It was a young, unemployed Tunisian man who couldn't get a job. And, and Lit himself on and fire. lit himself on fire. Mm -hmm. And that's the explosive potential that is present in Egypt. And without, by the way, massive foreign investment that's got to come, it's allegedly coming from the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates. But there's a long pattern of strong rhetoric and little delivery. Well, to use your metaphor of the oasis, here's what's been in the oasis over the last couple of years. Uh, let's bring this up if we can, Sheldon. Since July 2013, Egyptian authorities have jailed more than 41,000 people. Yeah. 29,000 of those are supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood. Others are secular Democrats. Six journalists have been killed. Eight remain in custody. And these numbers don't count. Mohamed Fahmy, uh, whom Canadians know well, uh, of course, because of the involvement of the Canadian government, or as Fahmy would suggest, lack thereof, in seeking his release. Can you tell us, though, Rami, how popular you believe al-Sisi to be with the average Egyptian today? Well, the, the cruel irony is that he is popular mm -hmm. uh, with the average Egyptian today because the average Egyptian today is in a slightly hysterical, frenzied state of fear, um, and they, the average Egyptian will do anything to uh, try to regain a sense of normalcy, and that everything is fine, the government subsidizes bread, that uh, electricity runs 24 hours a day, my kids are going to get a job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is a, a normal human reaction of kind of collective hysteria uh, at the fears that people felt in 2012 and 2013 because of the fear that the Muslim Brotherhood was trying to grab power and, and take over the country after they were democratically elected, and the fear of the, uh, the fragmentation, the fraying of the social fabric in, in Egypt. There were security problems, electricity cuts, gasoline shortages, and suddenly people got really scared, and they didn't want Egypt to become like Syria or Libya, and, th and then they started uh, in this mass hysteria looking for a, a savior, and, and Sisi saw this and stepped up with the old guard uh, and the counter-revolutionary forces from the Gulf and other places, and rode this uh, mass uh, fear uh, into office. So the irony is that there is support mm -hmm. for uh, uh, for CC, but it's not really re it's not real support. It's a, a reaction based on fear uh, and, and existential uh, concern about stability and a normal life. And this lasts only a, a few years because the. The, the fearful, the f conditions that generate fear and that generated the uprisings are brewing again and will continue to get stronger until they explode in, in some form that 
uh, that we can't predict when or, or in what form, but definitely it's going to happen. Janice. You know, just on, on, on that same point, what's really stunning to me, and I think Rami and I would know many of these people, is the small number of liberals, you know, democratizers in Cairo, and they're not a large number, they're really not, but they were so appalled by President Morsi. Uh, and the way he governed, the and head of the Muslim, the head of the Muslim who Brotherhood, who was deposed by al-Sisi, who was deposed actually by General al-Sisi, they were so appalled and so frightened and so alarmed that they supported the use of the military to oust hmm. their first democratically elected president. And when you spend time in Cairo now and you talk to the same group of chattering classes that should be leading the opposition to al-Sisi, it's not there, hmm. and they still invoke that the so-called terrible year of Morsi rule to justify what General LCC is doing. There's faint whispers now, just the beginnings of faint whispers, but this is a deeply popular president at this moment. And here's an irony. This deeply popular president and Israel and the United States, which don't agree on a heck of a lot, those three countries, now agree that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Yes, yes. How, uh, Rami, how has that declaration by Egypt very recently played out in the country? Well, you, you have different sentiments among different people in Egypt and across the Arab world. Um, many people who are now negative about Islamist movements will be happy to call any movement like Hamas or Hezbollah or the Muslim Brothers to call them uh, terrorist groups. This really doesn't mean very much. Um, the important thing is, what is the legitimacy of these movements among ordinary people? Hamas is different from the Muslim Brothers because Hamas is seen as a national liberation resistance movement, like Hezbollah in Lebanon. There's things that people criticize them for that, that may be legitimate, but they are not, like the Muslim Brothers, a political movement uh, mainly. They're mainly a resistance movement to resist Israeli occupation. They also have uh, desires to Islamicize society and do other things. So they, they, you, Hamas is different than the, than the Muslim Brothers, but because of their links with uh, Sinai, uh, and Gaza, the Egyptians fear that Hamas was involved in smuggling arms and things of that nature. And there's a general trend around the region with Saudi and UAE money to drive out the Islamists, because the, the Muslim Brother victory in Egypt represents the nightmare of the Gulf countries. They don't like democratic politics, they don't like populist politics, they don't like street revolutions, and they don't like any Islamic movement to challenge what the Saudis feel is their leadership of the Islamic world. So you've got four major uh, dynamics represented in, say, the Muslim Brotherhood and in Hamas to some extent, and these scare the daylights out of the Saudis, and therefore they give $10, 15000000000 billion to the Egyptians, and that's why Egypt is uh, taking uh, this position. For years, Egypt was mediating between Hamas and Israel and trying to talk to Hamas and work with it. Uh, so I, I'm not too worried about this. Uh, in the long run. Okay, that's got to be the last word tonight. Uh, Rami Khoury, it's always good to have you on TVO. We will, of course, pass along your best wishes to former Premier Bob Ray, who I know is a good pal of yours. We will Thank do that. You. He, said, he said he'll be watching uh, after the uh, Raptors game is over. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to have to have words with him about that if we can't. Uh, anyway, that's why there's 200 channels. Everybody's got choice. And Janice Stein, good to have you back on our airwaves as it's well. It's a pleasure, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.